Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us here on King Jordan Radio. The date is Wednesday, January 8th, 2014, and this is King Jordan you're listening to. Today we're joined with a very special guest. He is an author of many books, which include uh, Tupac, uh, The Life of Michael Jackson, and many more. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's introduce the one, uh, the only, uh, Mr. Randall Sullivan. Uh, Good evening, Randall, and uh, welcome to King Jordan Radio. How are you? I'm just fine, thanks. Okay, um... Uh, we had uh, Tom Miserol last week, and uh, I want to quote him by saying that all the Michael Jackson fans uh, may not like some of the chapters, but that you have concluded that Michael Jackson was not a pedophile. A, is this true? And uh, B, if it is true, can you explain that? Well, I concluded that I don't believe he's a pedophile, was a pedophile. I, nobody knows for, for certain except the people who were alone in the room with him. But the, I, I reviewed the evidence, I think, as thoroughly as possible, listened to the, the story of the, the family of his main accuser, and in the end, I thought that the evidence added up to his innocence, not his guilt. And... Uh uh, let's go back to the Jordy Chandler uh, case, which was in 93. Uh, it's my understanding that you had some access to the Chandlers. Uh, can you tell us about that? Well, I, I spoke to family members. I, you know, I identified one of them by name, I think, in, in, uh, in the notes of the book. But I, had, I did have to promise I that. First of all, the book is called Untouchable. It's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and all other your uh, local bookstores, just to get that out of there. But uh, back to the Chandler case. Yeah, well, I mean, so I, yeah, I, I did. I did speak to members of the Chandler family. I I can't uh, reveal their names. One of them is probably pretty obvious, though, uh, to anyone right. who knows the story. And uh, uh, and you know, when they were all adamant that Michael had molested Jordy, and uh, d- you know, describe why they thought thought that and they made you know a pretty powerful case it's just that there's a very powerful case on the other side uh in in favor of michael's innocence and the fact is that you know when you when you when you look at it all i mean the the entirety of the evidence the the amount of evidence that is in michael's favor is overwhelming compared to the evidence of his guilt and that's the 93 case right well, that's overall. The 93 case is, the, you know, it, it's the most troubling one. As I acknowledged in the book, you know, there, it, was, it isn't like I can say I have no doubt. There, there's, you know, in fact, one of the things I wrote in the book is that there's always going to be at least some shadow of doubt. But, you know, when, given that the evidence isn't strong enough to not only not to convict him, but to even to have charged him, really, uh, you know, you, you have to, at that point, give the person the benefit of the doubt. You know, and and I did in Michael's case. And uh, let me ask you: you heard the audio tape that was leaked, and then that was the smoking gun for me that said he was uh, not guilty. You have uh, Evan Chandler talking to, I believe, Ray Chandler, and to quote him, he's saying, "I don't even care about Jordy. We're going to destroy him." And what father would do that uh, if, if your son is molested? Yeah, well, he was act- he was actually talking to Jordy's stepfather at the time, but yeah, those, you know, he, he is. Well, I mean, you know, Ray Chandler, who is was the brother, uh, uh, you know, he had an explanation for that that you know m- made uh, Evan look less grotesque, I guess. But uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it it and and I mean, it it it, it shaded it the the conversation slightly but it didn't change the fact that this guy was you know he was looking for a way to profit from you know the 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 claim that his son had been molested by michael jackson and it's clear that he was more focused on how he could profit than he was on protecting his son right now a lot of journalists uh well let me let me throw a few at you 
they concluded, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, that he was guilty. Let's start off with Diane Diamond. Give me your take on her. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't. You know, it's not like I want to to diss Diane Diamond in particular. You know, she 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 committed herself to the idea that he was guilty. She only looked at evidence that indicated he was guilty, and then she staked a professional career on it. And and she was so caught up in in the the enormous career you know break she thought she was going to get when when Michael was convicted. I think that she was somewhat blinded to the, to the counter evidence, not completely blinded. I mean, she acknowledged that the father looked bad. Uh, it's just that she thought the evidence of Michael's guilt, she found it a lot more compelling than I did. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and she tended to sort of poo poo the, the evidence of Michael's innocence. And I think it was, it was, you know, whether it was rooted in her personal belief or whether it was careerism as, as, you know, Tom Messero would say, I, I don't know personally, but you know it, it was definitely one-sided her coverage. Oh no question, and uh, it was noted that she paid Francie uh, the maid to uh, uh, you know basically say that there were two different versions of what happened to Jason. He was tickled on one, and then the police said I got a hold of him, and he said nothing happened. So, uh, what's your thoughts on the uh, Jason? Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, the the one time you know Michael was actually brought to court and faced you know faced all of these witnesses at trial because he really was essentially tried for for both the 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 case he was being tried for, but he was also being tried for the Jordan Chandler case in that courtroom, and there was a lot of evidence about that admitted yes. in virtually every every witness. I, mean, I I can't think of a single one. In fact, I don't think there was a single one who wasn't torn apart on cross-examination by Mesro and e every time would show that they were after money, that they had changed their stories, that they tried to, you know, in some way profit from changing their story or telling the story that they thought the media wanted to hear. And there's no question the media was invested, especially the tabloid media, but all of the media really was invested in the idea that that Michael was a was a child molester and because that made it a great story in their minds. And when he was acquitted, uh, you know, the story was a lot less interesting. And, they, and, and the, when the evidence that he was innocent was admitted during the trial, that was not very interesting to them either. I mean, they were all running out. They'd hear the direct testimony, and they'd all run out and make their reports on these lurid accusations. Meanwhile, in the courtroom, Messero was destroying that with us and making him look in the eyes of the jury, like or her, uh, in the eyes of the jury, like a liar. But that wasn't covered, that wasn't reported, and so people who were just, you know, following the case in the media were getting a, a really, you know, skewed uh, point of view. I always say if you want to see a real pedophile, just follow the Jerry Sandusky case. Uh, what's your thoughts on the Jerry Sandusky trial and, and, and Jerry Sandusky? Uh, well, was he a mean, pedophile? It, well, it, it, he certainly looks like he was a horrific pedophile. I mean, I, I don't know the details of the case that well. I didn't cover that, and I don't. Right. I'm not. I'm not inside. But you know, all of the evidence that came out that, that I'm aware of made him look, you know, like a monster. And uh, it's just, you know, I, I think it's it's kind of shocking to us all that that you know someone that monstrous could could remain at large and doing what he was doing for for so long. But you know, it, it's a subject. It's a subject people turn turn away from. Is a lot of it. I mean, people don't want to believe it's happening. They don't want to be involved in in it happening. And you know, and if you're a person of of power and status, you know, people don't want to go against you. And the other journalist uh, was back to that. Uh, Ian Halpert also concluded that uh, Michael Jackson uh, was not a pedophile, but he did say some other things. Uh, what did you think of his uh, uh, book, if you uh, read it? Or uh, Ian, Halp Ian Halpern has zero credibility in my eyes. I mean, I, I, he's beneath talking about, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so let's go to 2005. Uh, we have the Martin Bashir documentary, and the family claimed that they were molest... Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gavin was molested, not during, not around, but after the Martin Bashir trial, uh, after the Martin Bashir Doc documentary. Uh, yeah, well, that, 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 that was a particularly difficult uh, argument to swallow for the uh, 
for the jury. And what the jury didn't even know was that you know the, the prosecution had originally claimed that the molestation took uh, place at a different time, but then they found out that Michael Jackson had a rock solid alibi for that particular date, so they changed it to a different date, and that date was after the Bashir documentary had aired, which, you know, as as Mesro said, could you th- imagine a more absurd time for, for someone to do what Michael was, you know, accused of doing? I mean, the whole world is looking at him and, and wondering about him, and then that's the moment he chooses to, to you know, molest this boy. I mean, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No, and uh, the report video that came up, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's, it, it was a really, I mean, Michael Jackson was a lot smarter person than people generally gave him credit for, and he was smart enough to have his own film crew, you know, sh- basically shooting Besser, uh, Bashir uh, right. do the documentary. So so he had it on tape. He had all, all of the times that Bashir was, you know, what Bashir was telling him and the way he was inveigling him and the promises he was making. And, and even the, I mean, even the outtakes from Bashir's documentary, I mean, those were pretty powerful for the jury, too, because they saw a very different Michael Jackson, a much more sympathetic and likable Michael Jackson, and they and they saw that Bashir had shaped the whole thing to make Michael look as bad as possible, that he'd manipulated Michael, that he'd deceived Michael, and that uh, uh, and they fundamentally tricked him. Yeah, give me uh, a thought to how Martin Bashir went about this. What was his goal uh, to do when he finished with the documentary? Well, I'm sure his goal was to make as big a splash as he could and get as much attention for himself as he could. I, I mean, I, I talked at length to Yuri Geller, who was the the friend. He was a friend of Michael's and a friend yes. of Bashir's, and he introduced the two of them. And basically, Bashir, he, he knew from, from Yuri that uh, uh, Michael had this fascination bordering around obsession with Princess Diana, and Bashir had done a documentary about Princess Diana. So when they met, Bashir just told Michael one story after another about Princess Diana and, and how close they'd been and how much he loved her and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and that really seduced Michael and, and, you know, got him tilting in the direction of doing it. Yuri told him it was a good idea. Some other people, you know, told him they thought it was a good idea. So he, you know, he, he took the step. And wasn't there another friend that was up for consideration and somebody named David Frost? Uh, to do that documentary? You know, I, I, I heard that. I don't know if that's true or not, but I have heard that story. But but uh, you know, Yuri didn't tell me that, you know, and he said he didn't know if it was true, so I'm not sure if that if that was true. And uh, and since he was the person closest at hand to, to all of the, you know, introductions and early negotiations, you know, he's the best witness we have. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, did Yuri uh, lose friendship with Michael after that? Yeah, yeah. Michael cut him off basically. Uh, felt that you know he'd given him bad advice and and you know gotten him into this horrific circumstance. So they really they had no relationship the last you know five six years of Michael's life, though they had been very close before. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, give me a take on um, the after uh, effects of the Michael Jackson, i.e. Uh, Bronca, i.e. Uh, the uh, estate of uh, Jackson's uh, uh, challenging AEG, uh, the verdict for that, uh, uh, Catherine and Joe and, and the kids going after that. What would you take on that? Well, that's a lot of, those are a lot of different subjects and a lot of different questions. You know, I mean, you know, I still think there are some questions that haven't been answered about how John Branca became the executor of the estate. And I, I don't know for sure that he did anything wrong, although I'm pretty sure he did something wrong in even having possession of the will. I think he had, Michael Jackson had, had ordered him when he fired him as his lawyer to return that will. And it's clear that Branca didn't return it, which is a problem for a lawyer. Um, but beyond that, you know, whether he did any of the other things that some Jackson family members have accused him of doing, I don't know. But I do know, you know, he's never really answered those questions. And I had a lot of, you know, I mean, he he and I, through intermediaries, exchanged many, you know, questions and answers. The, the estate lawyer, Howard Weitzman, and I spent a lot of time on the phone talking about all of this. And Weitzman himself had to admit that he, he didn't understand or know. You know, he didn't, he didn't really... 
he, he couldn't really defend certain things in this case, and and it, there were some things Branca just wouldn't tell him about, and in particular the you know how where the will was signed, the circumstances of the will being signed. I mean, here's Weitzman, the you know this big LA lawyer, the head lawyer of the estate, and he doesn't know the answers to any of those questions. And it was obvious; it was clear to me he didn't know those answers, and and he told me, you know, they won't Branca won't tell me. So you know, I, I you know, I don't know that Branca did anything wrong, but you know, I certainly have a, a I think a suspicion is reasonable, and and you know, it's amazing to me that you know he's never been required to answer any questions about that. No, and uh, the word was that he was in New York that day. Uh, if you watch well, you know, well, Al Sharpton's show, he, he was definitely in New York that day. There's no question about that. And the will is, you know, signed and dated, you know, Los Angeles on that day. You know that it was signed in Los Angeles. I heard different stories from different people. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, one of the people who was, uh, you know, Michael's accountant who was a witness. Uh, supposedly to the will, he, he, he at one time he said the will was signed in New York. Then he said it was signed in Los Angeles. You know, he told different stories to different people, and, and that <laughs> added to sort of the mystery and the confusion about it. And meanwhile, you know, you know, Branca and Whiteson were calling people and telling them not to talk, and everybody was clamming up. I mean, it, it looked really suspicious, but you know, I, I, there's, there's, it's not like there's a smoking gun, other than that, you know, clearly Michael was in New York, not in Los Angeles, and so the will is wrong on that point. Um, you uh, you wrote a phenomenal book named uh, I can't pronounce it Labyrinth. Labyrinth. Labyrinth, yes, with a capital L. A. Right, and you worked with a, a Los Angeles detective, right? I I worked with a detective who uh, was the lead investigator on the murder of of, of uh, Biggie Smalls, notor- notorious B I G, uh, and. Uh, uh, but was also involved in investigating Tupac's murder. But you know, he was also involved in the, in in this whole the whole you know Rampart scandal, which was this big fraudulent thing, really that that is related to the murders of Tupac and Biggie. What is your whole uh, opinion on this? Uh, what did you come away with uh, with Tupac and or Biggie? Was um, that, uh, and well, I mean, you know, I. I th- well, I, I, I think Suge Knight, I believe Suge Knight was behind both murders. I think the evidence that he was behind Biggie's murder is, is very strong. Tupac's murder, there's, you know, there's, there's some basis for doubt, but there's a lot of evidence that he was guilty. Uh, you know, I mean, I know Snoop Dogg told uh, the cops in L.A. that Suge had had Tupac killed, and he wasn't the only one who said that. But, uh, I mean, he didn't pull the trigger in either case. But, but uh, you know, there, there were you know, <laughs> unusual, you know, and disturbing circumstances around Tupac's death. And in Biggie's case, you know, what makes it especially disturbing is there's a lot of evidence that LAPD officers were involved, LAPD officers who were working for Suge Knight. LAPD, uh, they were working with uh, Suge Knight. Yep. There, well, there were definitely a bunch of LAPD officers working for Suge Knight. Um, that's for certain. Um the the evidence I mean, and Detective Poole believed that uh, one of those police officers had been involved in Biggie's murder, and then when they filed the lawsuit, when Biggie's mom and Faith uh, filed the lawsuit, the wrongful death lawsuit, their lawyers found evidence that another LAP detective was also involved in the murder. And uh, uh, but that lawsuit has basically died on the vine because of the the LAPD has. The, the judge who was handling the case died. The new judge gave the LAPD a ruling that they didn't have to turn over evidence, and so they couldn't continue the lawsuit if they couldn't get the evidence. And uh, do you think the OJ case had a lot to do with uh, them and just uh, if you just making that case go away, if you will? Well, I mean, the, the OJ case and a lot of others. I mean, you know, look, it, it was the whole story and, and, and the relationship of, of the LAPD to the city is, was fraught with tension, racial tension. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the OJ case had, had certainly not been good for, for the image of the LAPD, although the Rodney King case was probably even worse for the image of the LAPD. And, uh, but it was, it was a lot of things. I mean, the, you know, the, the city had its first black police chief, uh, 
Bernard Parks, and he was, you know, he was trying to protect himself and his own image, but he was also, I don't think he was really that concerned about protecting these black cops who were working for Suge, but he was worried about me protecting himself from the accusation that he'd let them work for, for Suge. And so, you know, he, he, he wanted this all to go away, and, and one of these cops, you know, uh, after he got busted for stealing and selling dope among the many crimes he was committing, uh, wow. you know, he, he, he told all this, the story that became the Rampart scandal, and he, this police chief, you know, backed the story, and the LA Times did an absolutely horrible job on that story and, and went along with it, and it took years before it to fi- finally become clear to people that, you know, this was mostly a made-up story. But by then, you know, the murders of Tupac and Biggie and their connection to, to all these cops had been sort of buried, and it was, it, was, it was really hard to dig it all up. I mean, the only reason I had as much as I did is because when Detective Poole resigned, he walked away with all of the documents. And then once the lawsuits were filed, the lawyers for, for uh, Biggie's mom basically gave me all of the documents they were getting so I could, I could really look inside the police department and see what they'd done. Unbelievable. And uh, who, who went first, uh, Biggie or Tupac? Who was killed first? first. Tup- 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 Tupac was killed uh, about I don't know, seven months earlier. He was killed in September, I think, of 96, and Biggie was killed in March of 97. But when you think about how long ago that was, I mean, that's more than 15 years ago now. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and the murders still haven't been solved, even though both murders were committed in the presence of literally dozens of witnesses. And my understanding with Tupac, he was at in uh, Vegas, right? For the, uh, he was, he was in Vegas. He, he was in Vegas. He'd just been involved in an incident uh, after a heavyweight fight, after a Mike Tyson fight, um, that may or may not have been set up. I mean, there was a lot of evidence that made it look as if Suge Knight had arranged this incident. Um, but, you know, it, it's not like you know for sure. It's just a lot of evidence that looks that way, and a lot of people thought that. But the other, but what goes against that is that uh, Tupac was riding in Suge's car when he was killed. But Suge didn't, you know, wasn't hurt at all. I mean, there was a, there was a whole story of how Suge pulled it off being in the car. And, and you know, and I, you know, I don't know if it's true or not in that case. I just think the evidence is, is, is certainly strong right. enough that it, should be, that it should be strongly considered. There's no question. And uh, Biggie was at uh, Soul Train, right? Soul Train Awards? He was at an after party after the Soul Train Awards. And uh, as, he was, as he was leaving the party, I mean, you know, Puffy Combs was probably the, t- the main target of the hit. But he, his driver blew through a yellow light, and, and Biggie's driver was forced to stop <coughs> at a red light. And that was where he got whacked. That's just amazing that these two cases haven't been solved. My understanding is that you spoke to uh, Biggie's mom. Uh, quite a bit. I mean, she she loved me after I, you know, I, I I wrote an article in Rolling Stone about Biggie's murder, and you know that was actually what initiated the lawsuit. And uh, uh, so yeah, we talked a fair bit. And uh, she's still looking for justice, obviously, right? She is, but I mean, the law, you know, they've let the lawsuit go. You know, I mean, like I said, they, they were put in a, a position by the judge where they couldn't get access to the evidence. It, I mean, it, it, it was left open. They can refile. And I talked to the lawyer, uh, the lawyer who was the main lawyer on the case pretty frequently. We're friends and, and we're friends even before this. And, and uh, you know, he, you know, he, he, he still, he still believes that, that, that that's what happened, that these police officers were involved in Biggie's murder, but he can't proceed with the case if the LAPD doesn't have to turn over evidence because he can't go to trial not knowing what the evidence is and, and knowing what they're hiding. I mean, the, the LAPD was already caught hiding evidence that implicated police officers. A federal judge levied a $1 million fine against them for hiding evidence that implicated LAPD officers in Biggie's murder. So, you know, they, they certainly are capable it. We got a question that came in from Donald Dancer, uh, wondering if Mr. Sullivan will ever write a book about California police officer Chris Thorner. Um, 
Probably not. No, I mean that's not a story I've covered. And, and Christopher Dora was was the, he he was the cop who went on a rampage and killed some people and then you know became a, a massive fugitive and they were hunting for him and eventually he was he was killed in a shootout that went up in the mountains. It wasn't very long ago. Oh, okay. That's that's very interesting. So that that that's unbelievable when you really think about it in the. Uh, were, they started out as friends, uh, Biggie and Pac, right? They they came in together. Uh, well, they weren't. I mean, actually, you know, they weren't friends. I mean, they, they were they were actually were sort of friendly at times. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, you know, Tupac developed suspicion that Biggie had been involved or at least aware of this attempt on Tupac's life that, that happened in New York, and and Tupac was shot several times, lost a testicle in the in the shooting, and. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but and you know Biggie was on the location, was at the studio where it happened. So Tupac had heard from people. Of course, he heard a lot of things. But he, one of the things he heard was that Biggie knew about the shooting and let it happen. I don't know, if, you know, that you know. I, I, other than that, Tupac heard that story. I don't have any evidence to support it. What's your best smoking gun evidence? You would say. Uh, when it comes to Biggie and or Tupac? Well, in, in the case of Tupac, you know, that, that this whole fight that broke out, was, and, and the, the person who was beaten up by a number of people, including Suge and Tupac, was, was the one who most likely did the shooting, who killed Tupac. Right. But, there's, you know, a lot of people who were there thought the whole thing went down very curiously and looked like it was kind of a setup, and then that guy who was a... Crip uh, came to court to testify on behalf of Suge Knight, who's a blood. So it, it, you know, it certainly made it look as if he was probably working for Suge. You know, so if he was working for Suge then, was he working for Suge before? You know, it, it, so it, 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 I mean, there was a whole bunch of stuff. But the fact that Tupac himself was convinced that sh that he might get killed because he was trying to leave Suge, he was trying to, you know, he, he made it clear he was leaving Death Row Records. He was setting up his own company. And, and he didn't want to go to Vegas because he was afraid of what might happen, but he eventually decided he'd look, you know, weak if he didn't. So he went to Vegas to, to hang with uh, Suge, you know, while a lot of people were telling him, you know, your life's at risk. And and, and sure enough, he got killed. Very interesting indeed. Okay, I have another core. 267 uh, please state your name and where you're calling from. It's your turn. Two six seven. Hello, my name is Belinda. I'm calling from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Oh, hi. Okay. Hi, I hear you. Okay. How are you guys? Just fine. That's good. Okay. Um, this is okay. Mr. Sullivan, I have a few questions it's regarding uh, your book on Mr. Michael Jackson, the great Michael Jackson. Sure. Okay, um, it's just two questions really quickly. Um, in your book, and I, I didn't read your book, but I, this is what I was, what I've read of, about your book. Uh, you went into really de de uh, big details about Michael's life and what happened to him, and um, a lot of fans didn't really like your book because you concluded that Michael was an asexual even though there's evidence that proves otherwise that he was uh, into women. Uh, that's my one, my first question is, how did you conclude that? What, what made you, conclu made you uh, believe that he was an asexual? And two, uh, your book goes into detail regarding the 2002 will that is rumored, well, I wouldn't say rumored, but I believe it's invalid. Uh, as you uh, concluded that Michael probably hired, uh, rehired the, one of the executors, John, John Bronco, before he died. And my question uh, to you is, do you believe that the 2002 will is invalid? And do you think that there's another will Michael did after 2002 but before he died? Well, I'm going to answer those questions in reverse order. Uh, for certain, Michael, there were wills after Michael died. He, he, he signed two wills that named a man named Al Malnick as his executor after, long after the 2000, well, not long after, a year and a half, two years after the, the 2002 will. 
And in 2009, he was uh, working to have a new will prepared. He actually hired lawyers. He was having his lawyers in L.A. work on it, and he had told them at the time that he didn't have a valid will. So he didn't know that the 2002 will was out there and, and in effect. I think, I don't know, but I think, I assume he thought that, you know, that, that will had been returned to him along with all of his other papers when he demanded them from Branca uh, back when he fired Branca uh, mm-hmm. in 2003. But mm-hmm. it, it, it wasn't returned. It remained in the, in the files at Branca's law firm. I think there are a lot of questions about that will, but, you know, it is valid, you know, because the judge has ruled it's valid. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, the, it's the, the will under which, you know, the estate is being run. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, I wish some of the questions about it were answered, but they haven't been. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of Michael being asexual, I you know I didn't say Michael was asexual. I said that that you know that's actually that the evidence adds up to that better than it does anything else. Your statement about how there's a lot of evidence that Michael was into women. Well, my you know people who spent time with Michael told me that he would admire women from a distance and and say they were attractive, but there was not a single bit of evidence that he was physically involved with any of them. You know, the, 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 the relationship with Brooke, Brooke Shields was basically, you know, sort of half friendship, half farce. You know, he never spent a night in bed with Debbie Rowe, the mother okay. of his two oldest children. The Lisa Marie Presley you know, thing is the only one where there is some basis for wondering. You know, I went, you know, with what I heard from people who were close to the situation. But I acknowledged that Lisa Marie herself said that there was a sexual relationship. She never got very specific about it. I heard some very specific things from other people who said that they'd heard it from her, so you know, I'm not going to go into those. But mm-hmm. anyway, you know, Michael was not, he did not have romances with women. And that, you know, that, that you, anybody who wants, the people who want to believe it are deluded. Okay. I see. All right. Well, thank you very much, sir. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks for the call. So you feel uh, basically uh, Lisa Marie, she did go on Howard Stern and say that, uh, yes, and we did have sex, and Diane Sawyer. Uh, yeah, she, she did. Animately. She did. Yeah, well, yeah, she did. And, and, you know, but I don't think very many people believed her, even at the time. And uh, But, you know, I, I think the people who were closest to the scene, you know, I mean, who, who were right there, including the, you know the person who introduced the two of them, and I think they, you know, were in a better position to judge what was going on than than I would be or anyone else from outside would be. <clears throat> and after I heard their description of what was taking place, I'm inclined to believe. I'm. Mean, I don't want to call Lisa Marie Presley a liar. I mean, you know, I think there was some kind of sexual contact between the two of them. I mean, I, I was pretty specific. I don't want to be graphic, but I. You know, I, I, I said in the book that, you know, I didn't think that there'd ever been intercourse, but I didn't, wasn't saying that there hadn't been ever been any kind of sexual contact. Absolutely. Okay, we're talking to Randall Sullivan, the, the, the uh, author of, uh, of uh, many books, and uh, you also uh, worked with Oprah Winfrey. Tell us about that. Um, well, I was, the, I was the host and executive producer of a show on, on the Oprah Winfrey Network. I only met Oprah Winfrey when I was on her show as a guest and then briefly at a, a party for the network, so it's not like we were hanging out or anything. But, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, 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 in some ways it was a great experience and in some ways it was a very disappointing one. I mean, you know, she wasn't very involved in running the network at that time and because uh, uh, she was still, she, she was finishing up with her, she was on the very last season of her show, uh, and and uh, it wasn't like she was totally uninvolved, but she wasn't very involved. And, and the executives she had running it for her were not very impressive people. <laughs> and and, and, you know, and they, made a, they made a lot of of dumb decisions. In in you know, you know and and, and I, you know I argued with them about our show, and you know it was you know in the end afterwards they 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 admitted to me, yeah, you were right and we were wrong. But by then it was too late. And and. Uh, Really, but, but but the big thing was that you know they'd found out, and we all had that Oprah, you know, she couldn't carry the audience over to her network. She couldn't be in the end the only audience that she could really carry with her were black women. 
So they made a decision to basically turn it into the Black Women's Network, which is what it is today. And uh, Oprah was granted an interview by uh, Michael Bike back in 1993, and that's yeah. the second best rated thing on a, a regular channel still to date. Yeah, and, well, I mean, uh, it, it was it was it was the most thorough interview with you know television interview with Michael that was ever done. I mean, she did a good job with it. I thought. I mean, I'm, I'm not diminish trying to diminish her abilities. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, she did a very good job of interviewing Michael <clears throat> and got him to talk about his childhood and and you know how wounded he was by it. You know, he, I think that was the first time he really you know talked about it publicly. Yeah, but through the years, uh, as Tom Mesereau pointed out, and a lot of other people, uh, she almost concluded that he uh, he was guilty of all this stuff. I mean, she had a pedophile during uh, Tyler Perry admitted to, to some stuff right before she was going to do Catherine. Uh, you know, uh, she said, uh, uh, and I'm quoting here, I guess we'll never know. Uh, I think it was in 2012. So, uh, you know, it was very disturbing to a lot of people. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I don't, you know, she, she didn't come right out and say that he was. She just acknowledged that there was a lot of basis for for suspicion, and there is a lot of basis for suspicion. It's just that there's also a lot of evidence that, you know, suggests that he wasn't guilty. I mean, you know, this this... By his own admission, and by you know, and, and anybody who does does the research knows Michael spent the night, you know, in in you know hotel rooms, bedrooms, you know, in, in you know he spent the night with you know dozens and dozens and dozens hundreds of of young people over the years, and in all of that time, exactly two accused him of molesting them, and and well three if you count Jason Francia, which I don't count him. <laughs> But, right. but you know, and and but in all three cases, the circumstances you know are pretty dubious. I mean, the, the accusers themselves look as bad or worse than than Michael does when you look at the evidence. So, I mean, j just That's by true. the numbers. And you have thousands, and you have thousands and thousands of kids that went to Neverland, uh, and you only have a couple, a handful that say uh, something untoward happened. That's not really the sign of a pedophile. And know you look at the and, and all and all the people who have ever tried to accuse Michael, you know, they've always had ulterior motives. I mean, now I mean Wade Robson is the latest. Yeah, we're gonna ask you about Wade Robson, what's your thoughts uh, on that situation? And the Matt Lauer interview he did. <laughs> yeah, I, well you know, I, you know, I'm 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 baffled by it. I mean Messero's in a better position to answer those questions than, than I am, but I mean, but he, you know, I mean, I remember Tom telling me that he decided during the trial to put I mean, Wade Robson as the very first defense witness because he thought he was the best def defense witness. He was so convincing that nothing had happened and that he just thought it was, you know, ridiculous to suggest that something had. And the jury clearly felt that way. I mean, you know, Robson's, you know, mother and sister also testified and, you know, they were all very, you know, they defended Michael adamantly and said it was ridiculous that anything had happened. Now, all these years later, Robson is saying, you know, that he was molested. But what's weird is he's not saying it's like a recovered memory. He said he always knew he'd been molested. And for some Which reason, was the first thing that was flying out there, who TMZ is known to get accurately a hold of everything. In fact, they were the ones to pick up Michael Jackson died first. They were the ones that said that he was recovering, uh, uh, getting a... Uh, uh, Rep, uh, memory something, whatever it's called. Uh, so they were saying that. So what the first thing he says on the Matt Lauer interview is, I want to just tell everybody that this is not a case of repressed memory. Yeah. And then he says uh, something to the fact of, uh, you know, I'm not doing this for money. Buddy, well, you well, put I out guess, a press I guess claim. It's a good thing he's not doing it for money, if that's true, because he probably blew his chance of getting any by saying that on the Matt Lauer show, because the only way you can make a claim this far afterward is if, you know, you've recovered the memory. Because yeah, I mean, you, isn't there if a statute? You knew, if you're saying you knew the whole time, then you can't, you know, you, the statute of limitations has passed, and you can't, you can't file the case. Yeah, he said a lot of 
crazy things. And, uh, you know, like you said, the statue, uh, it, it just doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't add up. I mean, a couple yeah. of years ago, you know, yeah. I heard he, you get, I just, I, you know, it, 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 the problem is, I mean, it's, and of course, that's always the, it's the case in rape cases and in you know, all cases, you know, you know, in most cases of sexual crimes, it's, it's basically you know one person's word against another. But right, uh, you know, I mean, the fact is, the you know, the evidence there there, there isn't any other evidence to support exactly these, these claims against Michael, except in the Jordy Chandler case, there is there is enough to you know. To raise questions, and I think most people who've looked at that case, I mean, I know, that, I mean, the fans were very upset that I that I admitted there was a shadow of doubt, but you know, I'm still saying I don't think he did it, but but I'm admitting that you know, there's a shadow of doubt, and we're all just going to have to live with that, and they, you know, they didn't want to hear that, and <laughs> which I mean, I understand, but you know, yeah, well, you, you've got to be honest about the evidence, and you know, I mean, I heard I heard the Chandler family side of the story, and you know, they did have a side of the story. They weren't, you know, I mean, you know, whatever Evan was up to, you know, he may have looked, you know, and, you know, and maybe he deservedly looked horrible. But, I mean, you know, Jordy's, you know, younger brothers who were part of the whole thing, I mean, they were adamant that that uh, that it happened. And, and they really didn't have any other ulterior motive. I know, you know, that it, for them it was just that it destroyed their family. Uh, Mesero was here and said that uh, he had witnesses ready to testify that uh, Jordy Chandler uh, disputed that claim if he was to testify. Yeah, yeah. So Tom know. told me that. To, Tom told me that you know a long time ago that that uh, you know he had at least three witnesses who were going to testify that Jordy Chandler had said it never happened that he he'd only made the claims because his father made him make those claims. So, all right. Uh, what's your witnesses. opinion on June Chandler? On who? Ch on Jordy? On June Chandler. Oh, June. I can't help but feel a little bit sorry for. Her. I mean, she was, you know, she was somebody who'd wanted to have. She was a beautiful woman who was living a kind of a, you know, low class life in a way. I mean, not not what she dreamed of anyway. And then suddenly Michael Jackson comes along and makes the fairy tale come true, and she wanted it to be, you know, she wanted to believe in it so much that she, you know, she she kind of didn't turn a blind eye, you know. And uh, uh, but you know when she when she told that story in court, I mean, most of the jurors basically heard, you know, her saying that she was a gold digger and that and and, and that, uh, you know. She, you know, she and her family were just looking for a way to exploit Michael, and and uh, so I mean, she you know she wasn't treated as a very credible witness by a lot of the jurors. I mean, that's what Tom told me from talking to the jurors afterward. And uh, the settlement. Now we we hear obviously we don't know for sure, but there were three counsel there with the the, the late uh, Johnny Cochran. There was also Howard Weitzman. And uh, I think John Bronco, uh, Tom, said here, and yeah, the, uh, the, the three of them. Yeah, everyone involved. saying everybody that Mr. Cochran advised. Uh, excuse yeah, me, well, MJ. Well, well it, that's convenient, isn't it? Since Cochran isn't around to defend himself. Right. But, you know, I mean, you know, look, I, I, you know, all I know is that, you know, I mean, Weitzman is going around saying that, you know. He he didn't he wouldn't go along with the settlement. Well, his name's on the settlement documents. Carl Douglas, the lawyer who you know took the documents. Yeah, Michael. Weitzman yeah, was I mean, you know, he, he, Yeah, well, he he said Weitzman's full of crap, and the, that you know he it, that he he definitely was part of the settlement. So I mean, I'm I'm inclined to think that Weitzman is not being completely honest on that subject. And Branca, I mean, you know, Branca was, you know, he was involved as, as Michael's entertainment lawyer, you know, trying to, what, whatever, you know, telling him whatever he thought was best for his career. And, you know, maybe he thought settling was the best thing for Michael's career. Well, it obviously, it wasn't. It was the worst, mist as I, I agree with Messer, it was the worst mistake Michael ever made. But. Okay, we have another question that came in. Were Tupac, Biggie, and MJ under any type of war enforcement surveillance? other than the L.A. 
police during the police leading up to their death? Um, Biggie was. <clears throat> he was he was being followed by the FBI, but not he. It wasn't him in particular. It was a member of his entourage who was suspected in the killing of a New York City police officer, and so they were doing surveillance on the group. And actually, they 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 were doing surveillance on the night of Biggie's murder, but they left. At least that's the story, and I think it's true. They they left by the time of the murder, but but they were definitely they definitely were following the group around, you know, shooting video, taking pictures, making notes, recordings, all of that. Right, right. Uh, the uh, hologram situation. Uh, who who uh, gets money? To, does that go to the uh, Tupac estate? For, for, you know, when for, they count that hologram? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, everything from Tupac's <clears throat> quote estate is going to his m mother, who was never very much of a mother, but she's certainly been a lot more involved since he died. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think she, I, I don't think anyone but her gets anything uh, out of, out of uh, you know, any earning, post-death earnings by Tupac. The Feeney show. Mm. Who I mean, okay. yeah. I mean, the, the the really striking thing about you know these two young guys is, I mean, Biggie had a great mom, and, and Tupac had a really lousy mom, and you know what that you know how how that shaped them, and you know it's 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 hard to say, but but uh, uh, I mean, it's really different women, and you know one is really you know got a lot of character and a lot of inner strength, and the other is does not. Absolutely. Uh, well, Stephanie Arian writes in, while Jordan Chandler's mother told police that she did not believe Michael had molested her son, a search warrant was issued allowing police to search Neverland. And she writes, my office, a strip search was performed in December of 93. Let's see more. Uh, 93 at Jackson Ranch. Uh, those presents included me, Arnold Klein, Tom Snedden, and an arrogant asshole. Michael asked Snedden to leave the room. The, the photos of MJ's genitalia did not match the description given uh, by one's huge inconsistency. Michael was uncircumcised. Chandler, many years later, finally admitted the molestation never happened, and Michael regretted ever trusting Johnny Cochran or Howard Weissman. These settlements were entered into uh, one primary condition that was Mr. Jackson never admitting, admitting any uh, wrongdoing. Michael, a month before he died, said Weissman, and Cochran gave him the worst legal advice of his life. Chandler, after uh, Chandler, after the original allegation, never talked to his parents again. Michael was never a child molester. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, a, a lot of that's true. Some of it's not true. Um, the uh, Let's go over. I mean, J Jordy did did break off his relationship with his mom, but he you know lived with his father for a long time afterward. They eventually fell out, and and he was estranged from his father when his father died. His father killed himself a few months after Michael's death. Yeah, what well, was uh, up with that? I have conflicting reports on that. He died for years. Evan Evan was suffering a really horrible disease, of, 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 you know, that involves a lot of physical pain. It's called Gaucher syndrome, and he had. Not, not just because of that, because he had mental problems and other things. He, he was in, living in almost complete isolation, uh, had no contact with anyone except medical people taking care of him, and, uh, you know, was just in a miserable state. And uh, right. so, you know, sitting alone in, in his apartment, you know, a high-rise apartment on the, on the New Jersey side of the Hudson, uh, he shot himself in the head, or actually it might have been the chest. And he got money from. He wanted to do. What was his deal? He wanted a screenwriter, right? And uh, he tried, that he, 
he he tried to make the deal originally that that he would get twenty million dollars, but in the form of screenplay. He wanted to be a screenwriter, and 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 uh, so he, the payoff would be you know screenwriting contracts. So he would write a certain number of screenplays for a certain amount of money. Initially, they started at twenty million, and then it got down to I don't know three or five million or something. And uh, uh, but they had a meeting, they, right? They, before they, well, any of the molestation. Uh, uh, well, before, like uh, there would have been never any molestation claims if MJ uh, agreed to do this, right? Probably not. He, yeah, probably not. There probably wouldn't have been any claims. But I mean, who knows if that would have eventually come out? But uh, Anthony Pelicano, who was the private investigator working for Michael, was convinced this was an extortion. So he was he was you know basically he, he was pretending to negotiate with Evan Chandler and his lawyer, but he was you know, trying to make a case that they were, you know, extortionists. And he, he went to the cops and, you know, they charged them with extortion. Right. I got another person that wrote in, Bronca was not part of the legal team. Well, Tom Mesero said that uh, in the night for the 93 allegation. Well, he, uh, he, do you know he, he was, John Bronca? He, he was and he wasn't. I mean, he wasn't direct as directly involved as as Cochran and Weitzman, but he was there and he was talking to them and he was advising Michael. He was advising Michael, and they met back in '83, right? I think it was. Yeah, I think it was '83. Yeah, maybe, maybe it was a little before that. I think it, it was it was after Af, Off the Wall, but before Thriller. Well, what was your understanding uh, with AEG and the date? Uh, was it supposed to be? Ten concerts and then well, blow me down all of a sudden. Why are those fifty concerts? And Michael yeah, well, didn't know and, and, and initially, Michael committed to ten concerts. Um, you got to understand, Michael was in really dire financial condition. Even though he had huge assets, but he was going to lose the most valuable of those assets by far, which was his Sony, his, his piece of the Sony uh, song catalog. Uh, and he had to he had to make about a hundred million dollars in about a two or three year period, or he was going to uh, lose the catalog. So he you know right. he, he couldn't and so he was being pushed you know uh, Tomei Tomei who would become his new manager the one first guy. He was very was shoddy, him. right? Very shoddy uh, character. Uh, you know I, I I tend to to take a, a much more benign view of Tomei than. A lot of people do. I mean, I think he did. I think he. I, th I think he did a pretty good job for Michael. I mean, you know, Michael's lawyer Dennis Hawk, who was right there watching it all. I mean, he he defends Tomei adamantly. I mean, Tomei got Michael to recognize the situation. Nobody else could get him to deal with it. Recognize that he he had to uh, he had to go back to work. He had to make some money, or, or it was all going to come crashing down. He got him to kind of clean up. I mean, you know, get healthy. Got him fit. You know, I mean, I mean, but I think he, he did, did a lot. Tell that lady, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, the uh, what's her, the black lady? Uh, yeah, the spiritual lady that uh, he was in fear of his life. Uh, what's her name? June, uh, I think. Yeah. yeah, June. Yeah, June Gatlin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Lovely lady. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, she's a bit strange. I mean, I had a long conversation with her and I couldn't get very many straight answers out of her about anything, although I did get probably the most colorful stream of, of uh, uh, cursing I've ever heard from any person. I mean, you know, she, she, she's got more ways of, of dropping the F-bomb than any single person I've ever known or talked to. But, but, but uh, uh, anyway, I mean, yeah, yeah, but you have to understand, Michael... I mean, Michael did that with everybody. I mean, he, you know, whoever was representing him, he'd start then finding a reason that there was a problem. And I think a lot of, you know, I, I think Dennis Hawk, his lawyer, was right. It went back to his relationship with his father, with Joe. You know, he, he, he needed this strong authority figure to motivate him and push him, you know, and guide him on the one hand, but then he started to resent that person because it reminded him of, of, of all the abuse that he'd suffered as a child. So, yeah, he, he did eventually turn on Tomei. Uh, but, you know, okay. I, I, I think Tomei did a pretty good job for him. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about Kyra Murray, but I want to play this clip for you, and we'll come back on the other side and we'll discuss this. I think, I think Conrad Murray needs to shut his stupid ass up and stop doing interviews. <laughs> I, 
I have done many catheters on many men when I was in the reserve. <laughs> and, and it's not a joke, but yes, you have to hold the penis, but there was nothing intimate about it. It's a medical procedure, and he needs to just stop talking right now. Stop talking. And you know, it's interesting because I, I agree with you, and you know, there's such a thing as patient doctor privilege and confidentiality, mm -hmm. right? And now, that tends to end when uh, the patient has passed away. Mm -hmm. But there's still something that comes along with that, which is the respect of the private details of someone's life, that you leave those alone as much before they were uh, dead as afterwards, because now it's the family that you have to think about. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. he, he's a human being. All humans have frailties. We all have problems. We all have physical illnesses. And, and, but to, to put all that out in the street is just, it's so exploitative. Well, and what's the point? Why are you telling everybody? You're just, that? yeah. <laughs> Murray is doing is if you thought he had no ethics before, and now you're sure of it. Right? Oh, that's yeah. Right. That's right. I just feel so... I feel so bad for those children. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it just it just doesn't get worse than this. I mean, the guy is dead. Mm -hmm. Just where is the respect? This He, he, he makes me sick, this guy. Mm -hmm. He makes me sick. I, he, is, he is clearly broken. I There's see, something really wrong with him. There's something wrong with him, and I think he's tried to show everybody that he and Michael were close. Like, the point is, we were close, we were close. He trusted me, but who cares? He's dead. Why? What are you trying to prove? By the way, this, just like everything else he did when Michael was in his care, Bad judgment. Yeah. That's Bad right. judgment then. Right. Bad judgment now. Bad judgment in general. All around. Terrible. Okay, that was courtesy of the talk. Wendell, well, what's your opinion of Dr. Conrad Murray? You know, well, he, was a, he, he, was a, he was a marginal physician who, you know, uh, was in deep debt and had a lot of issues, including legal issues. And, you know, Michael Jackson came along and offered him, the, you know, not only the ultimate escape from, from all of his problems, but, you know, an escape into this wonderland of being Michael Jackson's personal physician. So Conrad Mary got to go to L.A. and, you know, start going to all of the clubs and telling all these, you know, sticky-haired young ladies that he was uh, Michael Jackson's personal physician, which was really a lot of fun for him. And, and uh, uh, you know, but, you know, he was hired... You know, I, mean, I don't think there's much doubt that he was hired as Michael's doctor because Michael knew that he would provide him with the drugs he wanted. I mean, people, you know, Michael, you know, to, to say Michael was a drug addict would be an understatement, but also an exaggeration at the same time, if you know what I mean. I mean, he, he, he took massive quantities of drugs, but he was less and less affected by it. And, uh, uh, and he, you know, he, he had a, one of the worst cases of insomnia in the history of the human race, and he, there was only one thing he believed would, you know, give him a, a good night's rest, and it was a, an, an anesthesia that Conrad Murray had no business administering, but because he wasn't a, a anesthesiologist, but he agreed to do it, and that ultimately resulted in Michael's death. And uh, how does that work? If he would have had the monitor and the right equipment. Do you think Michael would have still, still been with us? Yeah, I mean, if if, an, if, a, if a you know a licensed anesthesiologist in a medical setting had been administering it, you know, it's 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 not dangerous in that setting. I mean, actually, even in that setting, it can occasionally be, but it's pretty rare. Mostly, I mean, it's used a lot in this country for you know minor surgeries, day surgeries. Uh, you know, it, it's not dangerous really if it's if it's done the right way, but. You know, it, it wasn't being done the right way. And, you know, he left Michael unattended, which he should never have done, uh, among many other things he shouldn't have done. And who knows what happened, you know, while he was out of the room. I mean, you know, you know wh whether Michael himself, you know, then turned the valve and got too much or Murray just let it keep running, which is probably the more likely, you know, description, Absolutely. whatever it was. Whatever it was, Murray wasn't doing his he job. He holds no blame. I mean, he's delusional when he talks. I mean, everything he says now is just, uh, I don't know what he's trying to, you know, he blamed Michael. Or, you know, it's just, just very, I don't know if you heard the, uh, the uh, 60 Minutes Australian edition uh, that I played for Tom, uh, yeah. where he, he, <laughs> He just I, you know, said, I, 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 I'm not. I'm, I'm really. I'm just not interested in anything he has to say. He's, I mean, he, you know, he has no credibility. I wouldn't trust 
anything, you know, what he said back at the time is all that matters when he was being interviewed by the cops immediately afterward and the evidence that they found on the scene. That's, that's the only evidence or, you know, statement from him that holds any interest for me. And, and you know, all of the stuff he's saying now is, I mean... Well, and that, okay. that's ultimately what helps convict him. You, yeah, don't, yeah. you might not get a conviction if you don't have that. I, 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 you know, I just don't care what he has to say. I'm surprised he hasn't tried to go to some other country and, you know, practice medicine again. But I guess he, you know, I've heard he thinks he can, you know, somehow get reinstated somewhere in the United States as a physician. <laughs> it's hard to believe, but <laughs> maybe. Well, are, um, I, we got. I need to wind this down. I don't know if. Yes. We're close. Let's just take one last call and then we'll wrap it up. Go okay. to California. Uh, Mark is on the line, and Mark, you're on the line with Rand Sullivan. Yes, good evening. Uh, is there any credibility? Is there any credibility when it comes to this woman called Pearl Jr. Uh, on uh, do you know her take? I, I don't know her. I don't. I she don't says that talking. Michael Jackson is still alive. Oh well, no. What's your take on that? Is he Michael still Jackson alive, or is he? In, no, Michael uh, Jackson. Michael, Michael Jackson is not in this world. He's dead. I mean, you know, the 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 evidence of that is overwhelming, and you know, I mean, there were autopsy photos, you know, you know, the, the, I, I, there was actually an autopsy photo inadvertently admitted at Conrad Murray's trial. So I mean, you can actually see Michael Jackson dead, you know, uh, and and you know, and his, his family would not have gone along with this. I mean, I, his, I mean, I've talked to his mom. I mean, you know, she's you know, she's lost a son. So I mean, this, this fantasy that Michael is alive is. Yeah, I mean that that started a lot with Biggie and Tupac. Yeah, Tupac, a lot. In, partic Tupac in particular. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, it, it started long. It started with Elvis. You know, I mean, it's it. You know, some any time a great celebrity who has you know truly passionately devoted fans, you know, then people will start telling the story and. You know, and some people want to believe it. If they do, you know, I guess it's, there's really no harm. The book is called Untouchable. Uh, Randall Sullivan, thank you so much for coming here and uh, coming on King George Radio and uh, saying your piece, uh, maybe favorable or not. Uh, you're a journalist, and you have to uh, do it by what you, uh, go by what you say. And uh, uh, But I'm sure the uh, MJ fans are happy that you basically, uh, you know, basically feel that Michael Jackson was not a pedophile. Is that I correct? I, that is correct. Okay. And uh, uh, to get, and the other book is called... Uh, Labyrinth. Came out, Labyrinth. Great, great uh, insight into Tupac and Biggie. Uh, I heard you on the, the stations in L.A. with a great, great site, uh, uh Great investigating with that story. So I encourage the uh, fans of Tupac to go take a listen. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Sullivan, and I uh, hope to speak to you soon. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it wasn't so bad. Uh, we have Randall Sullivan concluding that Michael was not a pedophile. <laughs> then, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap it up. But before I do, as usual, uh, let me plug the one and only Luna Joe 67. Let me tell you, she has the best uh, YouTube videos in terms of Michael Jackson on the web. Uh, first, you got to go to YouTube.com slash user slash Luna Joe 67. Right there, you will have what did happen on June 25th, an in-depth look on the day Michael Jackson died and uh, things around it and dates that are uh, very interesting. The other series that she has, which I just love, is called What Did Happen to Michael Jackson? An inside look into the trial uh, she'll go piece by piece with all kinds of interviews it is just amazing that uh, 
all the stuff you get to see is really like going back in time. And, you know, quite frankly, I watch it a lot. And uh, the other one, which is still, she still does, uh, well, she does the, the, what did happen on June 25th. But the other one is what did happen after the trial. So you get a series of uh, what did happen to Michael Jackson. Uh, and she has her website, uh, our Facebook page, uh, what did happen to Michael Jackson. And uh, what did happen after the trial. And what did happen on June 25th. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to King Jordan Radio. Thank you for listening, and we will speak to you Tuesday. Billy Caputo will be our special guest, former WWE referee, who refereed Hulk Hogan matches and much, much more. We will speak to you then. Thanks for staying with us if you have this much, this long. Take care, everybody. Ciao.